Okay. Thank, thank you very much and good afternoon everyone. It's a, a great pleasure to be here. I'm John Whiteleg. I work with the Stockholm Environment Institute and in the School of the Built Environment at Liverpool John Moores University. I've worked on Vision Zero for approximately 10 years. Um, it's very much misunderstood in Britain. Um, I keep being told that this applies to the rest of the world but not in Britain because we have a different culture. Um, I reject that explanation as meaningless and you make up your own mind as you go through. It's the Swedish road safety policy. Uh, a mistake in the road traffic environment must not, must never attract the death penalty. The only reasonable acceptable target for fatalities in the road traffic environment is zero. No argument, no excuses, no whinging, no moaning, no DFT dilution about, well, let's cut it by 20% and then 30%. Zero is the only acceptable target. But in Britain it's not understood because it's far more than road safety. It's a total ethical, total safe system, radical transformative policy with urban design at its core, public health at its core, and a new mechanism or process for ensuring that all these different professional groups and politicians work together. Um, in a sense, it's, it's a lot older than many of us realise. It was introduced in Sweden in 1997, uh, so it's 20 years old. But the World Health Organisation has been batting away quietly for many years, even before 2004, saying uh, something that alarms the road safety, uh, what shall we call it, the road safety profession in Britain does not accept that road traffic crashes are predictable and preventable. It does not accept, for example, that the WHO bans the use of the word accident. We're not allowed to use the word accident for very good reason, because there's no such thing as an accident. Road traffic crashes are predictable and preventable, and we can deal with it, we can eliminate fatalities, but it involves close coordination and collaboration, and things like holistic and integrated, things that in Britain we've managed to exterminate from our normal working pattern across many sectors, and urban design is at the core. But I've not found in the 10 years I've been working on this, I'm living and, inter living and working in Sweden and interviewing people, I find in Britain there is a lack of understanding. Uh, this is Ines Usman, the Minister of Transport in Sweden, who, who uh, steered this through the Parliament. There's a full parliamentary debate in Sweden that adopted Vision Zero. And when there was an argument, I, I've interviewed Ines Usman several times, and when there was an argument, she always rounded on the, um, the professionals, the engineers, the road designers, the road safety professionals, who said, no, 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 we can't do it, it's not realistic, and the whole uh, Ministry of Excuses. She always said, OK, I think the target for fatality should be zero. How many dead children do you think we should accept in Sweden in the next 12 months? Now, many regard that as a little bit um, uh, unfair. They said it was unfair, but she managed to steer it through Parliament and it's now in place and it works and it's effective and it's radical and it's transformational and it's not popular in Britain because we don't do any of those things. We don't like integrative, we don't like ethical, we don't like abolishing silos, we don't like coordination, we don't like public health specialists working with traffic engineers, working with urban designers, collectively with a common goal in mind. So we have an intense cultural problem. Uh, I'll run through these very quickly. This is just the background to Vision Zero. Any loss of life is unacceptable. When you get into an argument in Sweden, someone will always say, well, we've had Vision Zero before. It applies to aircraft. It applies when you get in a lift in an office building that's 20 floors high. We have an assumption that you won't be killed in the lift. You won't be killed in an aircraft. We've had Vision Zero in Britain, actually, on railway operations for many years. It doesn't mean that sometimes it goes wrong, but it means you have to literally move mountains. You have to do everything you possibly can to make sure that a mistake in the particular environment does not lead to the death penalty. And, and you have to make sure that the human frame, the road design, the public health specialist, the urban design, all combine together in a total seamless way to deliver zero. Um, this slide would take too much time to discuss in detail, but it's part of the paradigm shift notion. Vision Zero is part of a global paradigm shift. There is an acceptance in transport and mobility 
and public health and road safety that we cannot carry on the way we have carried on for the last five decades. We have to change things. And I'm not going to go through that list there. We have to change the way we do things. We have to do certain things like adopt Vision Zero. We have to do certain things like, for example, car-free streets. We have to do certain things like in, in the German energy sector. I'm not talking about energy today. Uh, the German energy sector is, is based now on what they would call the Energiewende. And we're now working on transforming the energy, the energy transformation into the Verkehrswende, the traffic transformation. So in Germany, it is accepted. There will be no coal, no oil, no gas, and the whole of the energy sector will be renewables. No argument, no messing about. It will be done. And it's exactly the same philosophy, logic, concept, and ethical, strong public policy. Another thing we've forgotten how to do in Britain. Strong public policy to achieve a particular objective. It's all about sharing the vision as well. This is where urban design comes in. Uh, it's no good having a group of people on floor 10 of the town hall discussing road safety and on floor 15 discussing a nice big shiny new roundabout. In, in the part of Britain where I live at the moment, uh, in Shropshire, uh, Shropshire Council has decided to spend £6 million on building two nice shiny roundabouts. Um, there's no discussion with road safety, no discussion with traffic and transport and mobility, no discussion with public transport, no discussion with residents, no attempt to reduce pollution, no attempt to reduce congestion, no attempt to do anything. It is a good idea to spend six million on building two roundabouts, they're only three million pounds each. So this is all about people coming together or with a shared vision and a shared objective and that's where Vision Zero is radical and transformative and paradigmatic shift. Again, in Britain, we don't do that. However, there are lots of positive things going on around the world. Uh, I was really amazed, surprised and impressed when the Mayor of London adopted Vision Zero in October 2016. So it's in his report, A City for All Londoners. Now, it remains to be seen whether we're in the uh, Jenny Raggett, five words but no pars parsnips, dimension or whether it will be real uh, there are signs it will be real so it is adopted it's policy and mayor of london it's spreading around the world quite rapidly <coughs> though i hasten to add not in britain so we got <coughs> excuse me new york los angeles san francisco <coughs> portland seattle boston philadelphia edmonton and even the united states federal government uh, i don't think trump has noticed this yet so this might go <laughs> Uh, uh, launched its Road to Zero campaign to eliminate... Now, we don't have anything like this in Britain. Do, do please take that one point um, away, that we have nothing in Britain that says we will eliminate road deaths. And the, even the Americans, I shouldn't say that, the Americans have quite rightly adopted that as a policy. Uh, no time to talk about that either. Lots of blobs on the map indicating who's doing Vision Zero and who's thinking about doing Vision Zero in the United States. It gets better. <coughs> um, the World Health Organization. Um, I'm part of the expert working group on physical activity. Uh, next month, uh, we will publish a global strategy which contains recommendations for every country on the planet about how to improve physical activity so that we eliminate as much as possible cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, uh, diabetes, obesity, and a whole number of other horrible acronyms, NCDs, non-communicable diseases. The World Health Organization Global Strategy on Physical Activity says we will do Vision Zero. We will do 30 kilometer per hour, 20 mile per hour. The 20 mile per hour thing is an important part of Vision Zero. Vision Zero just goes wider in terms of things like synergy and holism. So the World Health Organization is about to communicate its advice to every national government on the planet and we'll see how that gets messed up in Westminster. Um, so what do we do next Monday? <coughs> so there are practical things to do. So for example, we should shift the road safety debate into the Vision Zero framework. The road safety debate in Britain is a very, very peculiar debate. It's based on things like, if you're a child, please don't run out between two cars and chase a football. Um, uh, if, you're, if you're on your way to and from school, please look left, look right, and all this kind of thing. We put a lot of emphasis and pressure on the vulnerable road user to, be, to, to do things that will protect them from the person weighing 75 kilos sitting in a tub of metal driving too fast. That's the way we do it. That is unethical. It's unprofessional and it doesn't actually follow any of the scientific evidence. 
A 20 mile per hour is a general default speed limit is absolutely essential, and Rod King will talk about this tomorrow. Um, in other words, every street in Britain that's currently 30 mile per hour needs to be, will be, it will be one day, and it needs to be done tomorrow, uh, reduced to 20 mile per hour, and it will be enforced, and it will be part of a widespread behavioural, cultural paradigm change. Urban design is crucial, and I come on to some uh, basic ideas. I'm not an urban designer, just a general nuisance trying to change things for the better. And public health, these will change. Car-free will become very important. There are lots of ways in which, rather than whinging about busy streets near schools, shut them to traffic, make them car-free. There's no problem making things car-free. The only problem is in the heads of people that think that rushing around in a ton of metal to buy a packet of fags or a bottle of milk is the highest societal priority we can imagine. Right, that's the only thing. We can do it, but at the moment there's no will. You will recognise some of these slides. They're quite widely circulated. Uh, I, was, I was in Vauban in Freiburg in Breisgau last week. It's one of my... Uh, uh, regular visits to talk to the people in Freiburg and in the state of Baden-Württemberg responsible. This is a car-free residential development. It's not strictly speaking car-free, by the way. There's a multi-storey garage in what corner, uh, except to rent a space in the garage. You're not allowed to park on, in this area. Uh, if you want a car, you can. You must put it in the multi-storey garage, and it's €10,000 per place per annum. So that sends a little signal of its own. So it's car free, uh, compared to Jenny's uh, presentation a few minutes ago, uh, masses of green space, masses of planting, masses of nature, masses of child play. Uh, in fact, a very effective fiscal um, reaction to the costs of units because you get far more dwellings in an area like this if it's car free than you would if you're allocating 30 to 40% of the land to tarmac and concrete. They insisted there was a tram route put in place uh, before people moved in. Now imagine that in the British context. I've been involved in several uh, urban extension arguments in Britain in the past 10 years, mainly looking at transport and traffic and travel plans and accessibility analyses. And if you're very lucky, uh, you can build 2,000 houses on a greenfield site, there'll be a bus every other Tuesday somewhere, uh, and then that'll be shut down after two years. In, in a German context, this is a new tram route every 10 minutes from the car-free residential area of Vauban into the centre of Freiburg and had to be up and running it in place before anybody moved in. The streets are, are that's not a made-up photo, the streets are full of children playing. Um, lots of things like, uh, notice the trickery, it's not my trickery, you do the one that's nasty in black and white and the one that's nice in colour. Um, this is in near Freiburg, Hauptbahnhof, near the main railway station in Freiburg. You just simply take a bridge that was heavily used by traffic and you shut it down and say no more traffic. And it becomes walking and cycling. If we do want to have high levels of walking and cycling, and we do want to have healthy people, and we do want a civilization, and we do want health and happiness and well-being, we have to get rid of a large proportion of the traffic. And if we don't get rid of a large proportion of the traffic, we won't have those things. Just another few hundred consultancy projects pay lots of fee income to lots of people doing urban design that won't actually work very well because it won't have the impact. Okay, uh, before and after again, streets, we can sort out streets. We know how to do this. British urban designers know how to sort out streets. The problem, when it does go wrong, goes wrong in the planning process. Uh, this is Freiburg itself. It does help having a little stream running down the middle of the street. Okay. But nevertheless, it is a car-free central area, lots and lots of bicycle parking. 28% of all the trips every day in Freiburg are by bicycle. Liverpool and Manchester are 2%. Manchester's wonderful. I went to Cardinal Langley Grammar School in Manchester. I know Manchester very well. Its cycling policy is crap, absolutely crap. You know, it's not going to do, get anywhere. It doesn't do anything proper. You need to have lots of bike parking, lots of segregated, totally safe bicycle pathways. You need to have lots of uh, encouragement of cycling by reducing car parking, by car-free streets. And if you say we're going to encourage cycling without those things, it's simply fraudulent. It, it's a con trick. Uh, in the city centre of Freiburg, uh, like in Darmstadt in Germany, loads of trams, loads of pedestrians, loads of cyclists, and none of the British traffic engineering whinging that you can't have all these things mixed up together because it's dangerous. Okay? Space and time. i better finish, haven't I, Chair? Uh, <clears throat> space and time, I'm an old-fashioned 1960s geographer, as you might be able to tell. Uh, space and time are very important, and if we want high-quality urban design, high-quality health, well-being and happiness, 
high quality outcomes. And by the way, in terms of health and happiness, it's a good idea to stop killing our children and our older people on the streets, which is the objective of Vision Zero. You've got to do something really tangible, practical and real. What that means is reallocate space and reallocate time. Space and time are crucial. So all that means is more space for walk, cycle, bus and tram, reallocate highway space and sort out the time that pedestrians are given. You know, these diagrams are quite famous now. It's just that we, you know, you get a given number of people and that's how much space they require if they're in cars and that's how much space they require on a bus and then cycles. We know if we've got densely populated cities and we've got constrained <coughs> budgets, why do we go for the most expensive, useless, inefficient, defeating the laws of physics option? Sticking people in cars, one person in a car doesn't work. These alternatives, cycling and local public transport, do work. This is something I used to bore my transport students when I was allowed to teach at Lancaster University for many hours. This one takes an hour, so you're not going to get that. Okay? Um, this is a detailed empirical analysis at different speeds, which is the central column, about how much space you need if you want one person to move around as a pedestrian, as a cyclist, one person in a car. So, so if you go for that big red blob, one, two, three, four, five or six down, you see that the worst thing you can do is to have one person in a car uh, travelling at 40 kilometres per hour. We don't have enough space in cities. I mean, why would we choose the most space inefficient, ineffective, expensive, useless solution when we're planning our cities? This is what Shropshire Council are doing in Shrewsbury at the moment. They're very clever, useless, inefficient, ineffective solutions. So we've got the data, we've got the science. Uh, British traffic planners tell me our streets are too narrow for trams. Well, what's going on there? You know, most German cities have got fairly narrow streets with enormous big trams that, of course, uh, as many civic societies have said to me in Britain, they're ugly, so we don't want trams on our streets. Uh, that street is a particularly effective high density footfall street in Freiburg and it works very well. Time also. This is a wonderful diagram from a German colleague. In German it's called how fast can your grandma run, right? So, so basically you go around a, a few cities with a stopwatch, you measure how wide the street is and you measure how many seconds you have. Well, when, the thing, when you press a button and the thing goes beep, beep, beep before the green thing stops. And as you can see, even in Germany, which tends to do better than us, you have to be extremely fast. As, as an elderly grandma, you have to run at 9.3 kilometres per hour in Castle to cross the street. Uh, by the way, in Britain, we're very good. The Mayor of London fiddled, this is Boris, by the way, not the current one, fiddled the traffic light timings for pedestrians on 504 pedestrian crossings to reduce the time that pedestrians had to cross because he wanted to create the impact of reducing congestion because the one person in one car going out to buy a pack of fags is far more important than an elderly grandma running 10 kilometres per hour. So we've got to reallocate space and reallocate time and ultimately the next stage, think Mancunian way, think demolish it totally get rid of it. What's the problem? There is no problem. We could get rid of the Mancunian Way. Is that nice flyover in Liverpool still there near the tunnel entrance? Uh, this is in Seoul in Korea. Uh, well, it hasn't been bombed yet. This is Seoul in Korea. And they got rid of a very large six-lane expressway and turned it into a park. Uh, if you're really excited, which I know you're not, this is all in a very interesting book. Thank you very much. Okay.